So with simulations becoming easier to use, more engineers in the commercial and the academic space are utilizing its capabilities. Due to physical distancing, a lot of companies and universities are accelerating their transition to virtual prototyping. We wanted to make a few videos to help new users, whether you're a commercial product, uh, whether you're a commercial customer with a product or an engineering student with a project. Uh, we'll create two videos. The first one focusing on planning the actual project um, and what we should think about on a high level. And then the second one focusing on the actual structure of the simulation, getting into a little bit of the finer details and even some troubleshooting as well. I'm actually joined with Professor David Fletcher, who's a senior applications engineer at Leap Australia and an, ad an adjunct professor at the University of Sydney. Um, and he's been using CFD for, for longer than I've been alive. Um, so David Fletcher, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Sashan. Um, I started my CFD career back in uh, the early 80s when I was um, doing a PhD and writing my own code. I then joined the UK Atomic Energy Authority, working on a whole range of multi-phase flows where we, where we also wrote our own codes. And then I also worked with the group at Harwell who wrote the forefront of CFX. And I was actually interacted a lot with the development there, the testing, et cetera. Um, I also have my uh, university interests. So um, I've got students here in Australia, but also I have uh, students around the world who I work with, uh, particularly active with the University of Toulouse in France, where I've got a research appointment. I travel lots in Europe because I'm a mad history uh, buff. And um, at the moment, those projects really spread across lots of biomedical, so modeling stomachs, heart valves, uh, chemical process, modeling um, mixers, uh, dryers, et cetera, and bubble columns, and also doing a bit of wind engineering. So um, that's my background, uh, Hasham. Well, what about you? How did you get into the CFD world? Yeah, so I was actually a part of the former student competition in university. I was the aerodynamics lead um, for 2015-2016 at RMIT. Uh, so a part of that, we needed to actually design a kit. And the way for me to do that was to use a bit of CFD. So Leap was actually one of our sponsors. So we were using Ansys uh, software at that point. Um, so I got some help with them and that kind of turned into an internship, uh, which turned into a job. And then I've been working here since. So I do work on the front lines of support, helping out our customers. I've got some accounts. I do a little bit of sales. Um, I manage a website and we also do things like training um, and giving guest lectures as well. Um, and I'm also a part of the SAE organizing committee. So I was helping out last year and the year before with uh, some of the dynamics events. Um, so, I mean, enough about me. Um, what I'd like to understand, David, is how have you seen, you know, engineering simulations evolve uh, in your expansive career? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I think just, just referring back to your pathway into CFD, and it's so different from mine, um, and that is because the, the software has now become so much more mature. You know, a, 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 an undergraduate team can now start doing aerodynamics. Um, and that's really because we've seen such a massive improvement in the software, whether that be the GUIs for interacting with it, whether it be the physical models, whether it be the solvers and their robustness. And of course, that solver technology has also grown at the same time computing performance has improved. My PhD was done on a um, computer that has less memory than my current mobile phone. Um, now we, we've, we've all got access to clusters. And thanks to all those game players out there, we've also got GPUs. And those are allowing us to do some operations super fast now and integrate with the CPUs. So I think the bottom line is it's never been a better time to be in simulation with that combination of um, well-developed software and readily available computing resources. Awesome. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about the project planning um, aspect of it. So um, now if we've got some sort of project, usually we've got some sort of set requirements that we need to satisfy. Now, traditionally the engineer would churn through uh, a bunch of different designs in order to hit those targets. Uh, if they're happy with that design, we can then continue to the manufacturing stage, uh, proceeded with some sort of physical testing um, and validation of the product before putting it out there into the actual field. Mm. Um, now, David, can you give us a bit of an explanation about when should we really be thinking about simulation? Um, what are a couple of the, the key factors that we really yeah. need to think about um, in the simulation phase as well? Um, and who should be using it? What are the types of engineers that should be using it? You know, that's a, that's a good good question. And it's, it's really important to be thinking about that. I mean, let's imagine we're making some sort of product. Mm -hmm. Then once we've had an idea, it's exactly the right time to start doing some simulation, to build simple models and start looking at ideas, um, making really quite large changes. And we have um, a fast, easy to use tool called Discovery, which is ideal for that situation. You can quickly change geometry, change shapes, change conditions, and immediately get an idea of how the, the flow is behaving. Once you're happy with that, you can actually move those results into our um, more highly resolved simulations and do a quick check. Then it's time to build a prototype. We certainly don't recommend that you do away completely with testing and that because there's certain things you can't test for in simulations. But once you've got that prototype, you can compare how it performs with how you predicted it would perform, do some more refinement, and have a model there that helps you all the way through the process. You can even start modeling to optimize um, the use of materials, et cetera. If you're a consultant, typically you're only um, get to see a problem when something goes wrong. People hire you to fix a problem. So really your first step is to model the system as is, to try and understand the origin of the problem. And then once you've done that, you can start to look for a fix. So let's imagine you've got a mixing system, you've got very poor mixing, then you model that system. You can see where the bypass is happening. You can start trying some different baffle positions. Now, the good thing is that that's really cheap to do in simulation. You can move them around, quickly look and see whether it gets better or worse, do some optimization, and then you can give that recommendation. And that's key, I think, because every time you cut metal or do anything on a plant, it costs massive amounts of dollars in lost production, in materials. So spending that time in the software is really important. Finally, if you're doing research, then the software there is going to allow you to explore ideas again. Typically, you will be pushing the software to a limit. So it's really important that you know your capabilities there. Have you got sufficient background in the equations, in the physical models? If not, um, it's time to go away and do some reading, to use some of the many resources that Leap and Ansys provide. We have all sorts of tutorials online, examples, uh, blogs that you can participate in. Um, once you're confident with the, the physics and how you want to proceed, then the next step is to check whether you've got the right resources. Do you have sufficient licenses? Do you have um, computing power? Make sure you're using the latest versions of the software. Universities are often slow to update, but it means you're not doing cutting edge research if you're using five-year-old software. And once you've got that, you can build up the complexity of your problem. And remember, you might have been doing turbulence modeling for a year or two and become quite familiar with it. If you suddenly have to go move to multi-phase flow, you've got to repeat this learning process again. So um, I think 
with, with, with all of those applications, there's, there's a kind of a common theme about um, using simulation early, using it progressively, and using it to answer questions, um, certainly questions that we couldn't have even addressed um, five or 10 years ago. Um, so what about managing uh, risk in an actual project? How would you uh, deal with that? Yep. So I think um, when it comes to managing risk, it's about doing things systematically, um, making sure that um, you build on sound foundations. We really don't want to switch all the models on at once. We'd like to model um, things progressively and to know that um, each step is well validated. We don't want to be running a multi-phase flow when we've accidentally got the mesh dimensions wrong and we've got um, a microscopic mixing vessel. So um, if you do things systematically, you kind of know what you know. And if you know what you don't know, you can bridge and move forward in a systematic way. And I really can't emphasize that enough. Be systematic, take small steps, check as you go. Awesome. Look, thanks a lot for that, David. Um, I think you've given us a lot to really think about uh, in the planning phase. Um, so part two, we wanted to focus on uh, what actually happens, you know, when we've got a plan in place um, and what we need to think about before we actually open the software and hit solve. All right, well, uh, we'll see everyone for part two. Thank you.